Hello, I'm Julian Halcox, Professor of Cardiology at Cardiff University, and I'm going to be talking to you about the assessment of coronary endothelial function. As we know, the vascular biology of atherosclerosis takes place over many years, starting in early, early life often in, in, in the context of exposure to, uh, to risk factors such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, dysglycemia, and so forth. And uh, it's an inflammatory condition and inflammation is in part but not entirely triggered by exposure to the, the risk factors. And the risk factors will themselves be influencing the, the biology of the disease process both through inflammation and through inflammation independent processes. And it, it typically takes many years, even decades, until patients present uh, in middle age and later life with uh, myocardial infarctions or ischemia due to, uh, to, occlusion, to, to uh, narrowing and uh, occlusion of the vessel. And this complex process is all played out in the context of the individual's genotype with genes that make them more susceptible to uh, the impact of risk factors, more likely to have risk factors or even less likely to have risk factors or positive uh, genetic influences on the disease processes. Now, what I'm going to talk about primarily is the role of the endothelium and focusing on the coronary endothelium and how we might harness techniques to assess coronary vascular endothelial function in clinical practice. This is what the coronary endothelium looks like. It's a, a single-celled layer, a monolayer of, uh, of tightly packed spindle-shaped cells, and this is an, an example of what the endothelial cells look like at the site of a coronary bifurcation, one of the areas that's most susceptible to, uh, to atherosclerosis. Now, looking at the, the processes in a, in a little more detail over, over time, starting from the left, the initial processes of uh, exposure to, to risk factors and activation of the endothelium, which uh, in part uh, is responsible for promoting the adhesion and infiltration of uh, leukocytes into the subintimal space, invasion, uh, migration, proliferation of uh, vascular smooth muscle cells. The monocytes will take up lipid as in the form of uh, LDL predominantly and predominantly oxidatively modified LDL, eventually proliferating and becoming a large organized lipid rich, inflammatory cell rich plaque which may be at risk of rupturing and, and forming an acute uh, thrombotic occlusion of the vessel, or perhaps if it grows and becomes obstructive, limiting the flow of blood downstream and causing ischemia of, uh, of the organ system. And there are many causes and also many consequences of endothelial dysfunction. And you can see here we've listed a few, um, importantly at the top, and this is what the, the technique that we harness to assess endothelial function, so endothelial dysfunction will promote a, a more vasoconstrictor environment which can enhance uh, ischemia, it can promote thrombosis and occlusion as a consequence of adverse vaso vasodilator tone, it can enhance hypertension, be implicated in reperfusion injury, progression of, uh, of obstructive disease, inflammatory diseases, immune interactions, uh, dyslipidemia can influence endothelial function, diabetes, heart failure, etc., etc. Now, in order to uh, think about vascular function testing, it's important to understand the, the mediators that are influencing vascular tone. And in the coronary circulation, the most important uh, endothelium-derived vasodilators are nitric oxide, predominantly in the conduit vessels, so the epicardial vessels, and more importantly in the microvasculature, endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization. Prostacycline only plays a very small role in uh, maintaining coronary vasodilator tone. Nitric oxide predominant in the uh, conduit circulation, and EDHF more predominant in the uh, microvascular resistance circulation. But balancing this out, there are also constrictor factors, those produced by platelets when they're activated, 5-HT and thromboxane, although hopefully in an environment where platelets aren't being activated, these don't have much influence on, on basal constrictor tone. But importantly, endothelin, angiotensin generation, vasoconstrictor prostanoids, superoxide, uh, O2 uh, free radicals, and of course the influence of, uh, of, of uh, neurologically derived uh, adrenergic agents such as norepinephrine through the, um, through the, uh, the, the adventitial nerves which can promote vasoconstriction.
Now nitric oxide is key and the tests that we use to assess endothelial function rely on the ability to stimulate nitric oxide and in the context of a dysfunctional endothelium we will typically see a reduced bioavailability of nitric oxide and the main reason for that is that the uh, nitric oxide, it's not that the enzyme isn't around, it's not that the enzyme isn't being stimulated, it, it even is often able to generate nitric oxide but the nitric oxide that is being generated will typically react with free radicals such as superoxide or peroxynitrite which will denature the nitric oxide to other higher um, nitrogen oxides. Also in the context of, uh, of, of an endothelial activation and dysfunction, uh, nitric oxide can become uncoupled and rather than generating nitric oxide it can generate uh, superoxide itself therefore enhancing the oxidative stress and further worsening the bioavailability of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide will percolate across to the smooth muscle where it will uh, activate cyclic GMP, lead to um, uh, activation of, uh, of calcium, uh, re reduction of uh, calcium within the smooth muscle, leading to re reduction of uh, vascular tone. And um, in the context of exposure to risk factors or in coronary disease or heart failure, there's a reduced supply of nitric oxide and therefore less ability to, 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 to see nitric oxide mediated dilatation. So when we're thinking about vascular function testing we essentially want to harness the ability of the endothelium to produce nitric oxide and we would typically in the coronary circulation look at um, pharmacological probes that will trigger um, endothelial release of nitric oxide synthase, uh, uh, trigger the activity of nitric oxide synthase and release of nitric oxide. The probe that we use most commonly is acetylcholine and there are standard doses that one would use and the acetylcholine activates nitric oxide th synthase through muscarinic um, receptors which are present on the endothelial cell surface. Now acetylcholine not only activates muscarinic uh, receptors on endothelial cells but it also activates muscarinic receptors on smooth muscle cells where there's a, a, a counter uh, response of vasoconstriction, so that actually promotes vasoconstriction, uh, it, the, the muscarinic responses. But in a healthy endothelium at the doses of acetylcholine that we use in, in uh, clinical pharmacology, uh, the, coronary, the coronary circulation, the net effect in a healthy endothelium is a dilator response. However, if there's um, reduced bioavailability of nitric oxide, you'll have a, a lower amount of uh, dilatation in response to acetylcholine or perhaps even constriction. Other agents that we harness are substance P and bradykinin and also enhancing shear stress through, uh, through, uh, through uh, techniques which I'll describe later. And in, in order to see whether any defect in uh, the response to acetylcholine or these other agents is indeed endothelium, we will look at responses to endothelium independent dilators here for, for example glycerol trinitrate or sodium nitroprusside which are exogenous uh, donors of nitric oxide which will activate smooth muscle guanyl cyclase independently of the endothelium leading to smooth muscle dilatation so we see a depressed response to acetylcholine but a normal response to GTN or SNP then we can safely assume that the defect is an endoth at the endothelial level rather than at the level of the smooth muscle. We also uh, harness adenosine, and this is predominantly a, a dilator of the resistance arterioles. It only has a relatively uh, minimal impact on conduit vessels, and uh, this is used to assess uh, endothelium-dependent uh, microvascular uh, flow reserve. Now this is the setup that we use for coronary vascular function testing. The, um, the the, uh, the studies are performed at cardiac catheterization, so it's an inv invasive test and therefore it's, re it's really restricted to people who require cardiac catheterization for clinical reasons, obviously for ethical and safety reasons. Now we'll use a standard uh, guide catheter to, uh, to cannulate the coronary artery and we will typically try and use the left anterior descending artery if, if possible, it's typically the most uniform and has the, the longest, straightest uh, segments in it, typically. And into the uh, vessel we will pass a very thin guide wire which is, has a Doppler crystal at the tip. And this Doppler crystal can be used to measure flow velocity 
in the coronary circulation. So we, by changing the resistance of the vessels downstream, that we will therefore see changes in coronary blood flow from which we can calculate flow volume changes and also changes in coronary vascular resistance, knowing the, knowing the pressure. We can also, over this uh, guide wire and through the, the coronary guide catheter, uh, insert a very thin infusion catheter. So we can selectively cannulate the left anterior descending artery, or if we're choosing the circumflex artery, we can, we can infuse into the circumflex. And this means that we only have to infuse medication into one coronary artery and, we don't, and not the other main coronary artery. Therefore, not only limiting the amount of medication that you have to give, uh, to do the study, thus limiting the potential for systemic side effects, but also allowing us to look at the, um, the reference vessel that's not being infused with, uh, with the medication to see if there are any other changes as a consequence of background physiological changes that may be independent of the pharmacological stimulation of the coronary artery itself. So this is essentially the setup, and through the catheter in a typical protocol we'll, we'll infuse acetylcholine, typically at two or three doses from 10 to the minus six through to 10 to the minus five and occasionally higher doses of 10 to the minus four uh, molar concentration. Also uh, intracoronary nitroglycerine to, to test endothelium independent responses and then also intracoronary adenosine and that will impact on the microvascular circulation predominantly maximizing the microvascular dilatation. Now, intracoronary adenosine, of course, causing marked microvascular dilatation will cause a, a significant increase in flow through the coronary circulation. And if we measure the diameter change in the coronary artery proximal to where the infusion catheter is delivering the adenosine, this is looking at a, an area of the coronary circulation which isn't being exposed to the adenosine, but is being exposed to the increased flow stimulus that's a consequence of the dilatation that's occurred downstream in the, in the resistance vessels. And therefore, in addition to measuring change in the resistance circulation, we can measure upstream changes in coronary diameter and measure flow-mediated dilatation of the coronary artery, which is a more physiological stimulus than the pharmacological stimulus of acetylcholine. So we measure changes of the, uh, the diameter of the vessel with uh, conventional coronary angiography and we measure changes in velocity uh, using the, the Doppler crystal. And here is an example of the type of trace that we see with a, a Doppler uh, flow wire in the coronary circulation. And you can see that um, we can measure a number of uh, parameters of the, uh, of the coronary flow profile. And it's, of course, it's pulsatile flow, so there's a rapid increase in flow in early diastole. As the, the heart stops contracting, flow, of course, in the coronaries is, uh, is diastolic predominantly rather than systolic. So you can see there's initial upstroke in the velocity, which gradually tails off. And the typical uh, velocity that we will use for calculating coronary flow is the average peak velocity. But other, um, uh, the other, other parameters can be measured as well, such as the area under the curve and deceleration time and so forth. And we look at changes in the, the ratio of flow at baseline to, to peak as the, the standard way of assessing the change in flow in response to the agents we use. So how do we, uh, well, what, do we, what do we see with these results? And th this is the, uh, the results of a classical study performed by Ludmo and colleagues in, uh, in the Brigham uh, Harvard University Medical School uh, conducted uh, in the 1980s. And this was the, really the seminal paper looking at the impact of clinical pharmacological stimulation of the coronary circulation. And if we look on the, the left, you can see the impact of, um, of, of acetylcholine infusion into a diseased uh, coronary artery. And this is a, a vessel that, uh, from a patient with atherosclerosis with an area of moderate uh, coronary disease. The C1 and the C2 uh, markers, they are just control, inf in control infusion, so before the infusion of, uh, of acetylcholine. And there where we see the fall in the, the diameter, that's uh, in response to acetylcholine. And you can see clearly here that not only in the stenotic segment in white is there constriction, but also in an area upstream of the stenotic segment, in a more normal looking area of the, the vessel, there's a degree of constriction to acetylcholine, suggesting that there's a predominant muscarinic stimulus on the smooth muscle, rather than in, the, uh, in, uh, in relation to the endothelial release of nitric oxide. 
and then there's another control, C3, and then there's the response to nitroglycerin, and you can see that there is a, a fairly normal dilatation in response to nitroglycerin. Now, if you turn your attention to the graph on the right with a curve in pink, you can see that in, in a normal uh, coronary artery from a, 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 a normal patient with, without any evidence of, uh, uh, of uh, atherosclerotic disease, you can see that there's dilatation in response to acetylcholine, and uh, that's the first uh, area of rise on the graph. So sig significant dilatation in a normal vessel, and then further dilatation again in response to nitroglycerin, showing clearly the difference between the responses to acetylcholine in a diseased vessel and a healthy vessel. Another uh, seminal uh, series of papers from Arshed Kaimi, who was my mentor at the NIH in the late 90s and, and uh, early noughties, uh, Arshed Kaimi carried out a, a study looking at uh, the impact of nitric oxide inhibition, uh, nitric oxide synthase inhibition, using uh, intracoronary infusion of LNMMA, which is a competitive inhibitor of nitric oxide synthase, which competes with L-arginine, which is the substrate for, for ENOS. Uh, to, to work. And you can see here that in, in, uh, in patients with um, normal coronary arteries on the left hand side there in the, the top curve in blue, this is showing that if you inhibit nitric oxide synthase with LNMMA, there's a fairly dramatic increase in coronary vascular resistance, suggesting a quite marked vasoconstriction in response to uh, nitric oxide inhibition. Whereas in contrast, if you infuse LNMMA in patients with actually normal coronary arteries but uh, significant risk factors for coronary disease, or with ather in yellow or in pink with atherosclerosis, atherosclerotic disease itself, you can see that there's far less vasoconstriction in response to endogenous uh, in 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 inhibition of endogenous nitric oxide synthase. And that is actually telling you that at baseline, there's more nitric oxide being produced causing va vasodilatation in healthier patients without exposure to risk factors or presence of disease. So there's a greater tonic basal release of nitric oxide in those circumstances. Similarly, if we turn our attention to the right, you can see that there's greater, this is the change in, in diameter of the epicardial vessels, so the conduit vessels that you can see at angiogram. You can see that there's a greater degree of constriction in the normal coronary arteries in blue than there is in patients with normal coronary arteries and risk factor exposure, and there's greater constriction then over uh, compared with patients who have moderate atherosclerotic disease. And again, the greater amount of constriction when you block nitric oxide synthase suggests that there's more, suggests that there's more nitric oxide being produced at baseline by these vessels maintaining coronary tone in these circumstances. So essentially the healthier the vessel, the less risk factors that it's, exp that it's exposed to or the less atherosclerotic disease, the greater amount of nitric oxide that's being produced at baseline. And if we consider the, the, the previous responses to um, acetylcholine, the greater the uh, amount of nitric oxide that can be produced in response to a pharmacological stimulus. So once you expose a vessel to risk factors or there's a disease vessel, there's less nitric oxide being produced at baseline and less nitric oxide able to be produced on stimulation. But how does this impact on the, the disease processes themselves. Well, if we want to draw clinical inferences, we can see here in a study of just over 300 patients that we followed up for just under four years uh, who'd had coronary vascular function testing performed at the NIH. We found that the individuals who had a dis more dysfunctional constrictor response in their epicardial vessels compared with the dilator response had a far greater incidence of uh, cardiovascular death, acute coronary syndrome, strokes, and need for urgent revascularization. So if you've got a dysfunctional response to ACH, this actually predicts someone who's going to be at greater risk in the future of developing an acute vascular event. Whereas if we look at the, uh, the dilator responses to sodium nitroprusside here graded according to tertiles, so we see that there doesn't really seem to be any impact of how well someone responds to exogenous nitric oxide. It's really the endogenous nitric oxide release that has the greatest prognostic bearing, whereas the sodium nitroprusside response doesn't have any prognostic information. Similarly, if we look at what's happening in the microvasculature, uh, it, we see similar responses. And here we've broken it down according to people who have unobstructed normal looking coronary arteries on the left and people with um, mild to moderate coronary artery disease here on the right. And if you look over on the left, the individuals who have the best dilator response, seen in yellow, they have a very low event rate compared to those with the worst 
um, response to acetylcholine, suggesting that if you have microvascular dysfunction, this is uh, illustrating that someone's at greater risk of developing a major vascular event with follow-up. And this is even in the case in people with normal looking coronaries. And interestingly, we found, although it's difficult to draw any firm inferences from this, but if you look at the, uh, the orange survival curve on the left in patients with normal coronaries and the yellow survival curve on the right in patients with moderate coronary artery disease, we found that the event rate was actually higher in people with normal coronaries but endothelial dysfunction than in those people who actually had evidence of coronary artery disease but had relatively well-preserved coronary endothelial function, suggesting that this is indeed providing some sort of idea of the, the, the biological environment that's promoting the risk of progression and destabilization of, of disease for the future. Now, there is a relationship between coronary endothelial function and peripheral vascular function. In, a, in other modules in this course, you will be uh, hearing about non-invasive ways to assess peripheral endothelial function. And of course, the knowing what's going on in the coronary arteries is really the, the gold standard because that's where most of the disease events uh, from atherosclerosis actually occur. But it is important to know whether or not the peripheral vascular function testing is actually telling us something useful about what's happening in the coronary circulation. And one of the, uh, the first uh, and probably the most important papers to look at this was uh, again carried out in Harvard by Todd, here in this case by Todd Anderson, showing that there is a moderately good correlation but far from perfect correlation between what um, what we measure in the coronary circulation in response to acetylcholine and what can be measured by non-invasive me methods, ultrasound uh, assessed flow mediated dilatation in the peripheral uh, vasculature. So peripheral endothelial function will tell you some but not all about what's going on in the coronary circulation and it's a barometer of your systemic vascular health but really the cor coronary circulation assessment is the gold standard. So what can we do to improve endothelial function? Well, of course, um, we, we need to think of the endothelium as a, as a means of responding to uh, physiological and pathological stimuli that um, may help maintain your vascular health or perhaps uh, enhance the atherogenic milieu and promote plaque promotion and instability. And if we think about these, um, these various parameters and the various influences, the important ones, LDL, cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, heart failure and so forth, all of these uh, risk factors seem to enhance the oxidative stress and inflammatory environment within the, the vessel. So if, if we can actually enhance that environment, minimize the amount of uh, oxidative stress, reduce the amount of inflammation in the, in the vascular environment, we should potentially enhance the availability of NO and restore the balance between the sort of the, the harmful influences of endothelial activation and the more beneficial impact of nitric oxide on maintaining vascular health. And I'll just uh, run through a few uh, of, of what I feel are a selection of interesting and potentially important uh, studies that have been done. Here this is a, a, a sequential study performed in the cath lab on, on separate days and patients undergoing coronary, vascular, uh, coronary uh, angiography who had um, their vascular function assessed at baseline and then the following day after just a, a single oral treatment of pravastatin having previously been pravastatin naive. Now if you look at the left there was a degree of vasoconstriction, dysfunctional coronary endothelium in response to acetylcholine, and that was unchanged before and after placebo. But if we look on the right, we can see in yellow the amount of vasoconstriction that, um, that we're seeing. I think, sorry, I think this is, uh, this is mis, um, uh, uh, this is, um, uh, has been mislabeled. That uh, in yellow, this is after, so there's less vasoconstriction in response to acetylcholine within 24 hours of treatment with pravastatin. And this is before measurable changes uh, in the cholesterol level, so perhaps through the, the, um, the anti-inflammatory so-called um, uh, pleiotropic effects of, uh, of statin. This is an example of acute uh, intra-arterial intra uh, administration of, of angiotensin, the angiotensin 1 receptor blocker Lasartan that we conducted at the uh, National Institutes of Health, and we were looking at physiological dilatation. We looked at flow-mediated dilatation, so the, the uh, conduit vessel dilatation in response to downstream uh, infusion of adenosine and increase in flow. We also used hand grip exercise and cold presser test, which um, essentially in, in health will result in um, 
uh, sympathetically mediated vasodilatation and uh, in part flow mediated dilatation of the coronary arteries. And we can see here in yellow that not only flow mediated dilatation but also the um, more uh, dysfunctional response to, uh, to exercise and cold pressure testing which persisted in the control was no, long, was no longer there following Losartan. So acute uh, angiotensin receptor blockade enhancing the amount of um, vasodilatation that we see in response to standard physiological stimuli in the coronary circulation. This is a, a, a lar larger, um, longer term study and we can see here that um, six months treatment of quinapril will enhance coronary microvascular uh, function in, in a, a small pilot study here. And uh, this is just an example of the uh, potential benefits of ACE inhibition on coronary endothelial function. There are a number of uh, other publications that have demonstrated an enhancement of uh, endothelial dependent dilatation with ACE inhibition. Okay, and, and finally, just, just as an example of uh, the differential impact of, uh, uh, of endothelial dysfunction along the, circ the circulation, we can see along the coronary circulation, we can see four separate panels. At the baseline, just the, the, the baseline angiogram in panel A. And in panel B, you can see that after intracoronary infusion of acetylcholine, but just after the bifurcation, right in the middle of the picture, there's a, an area that looks slightly irregular at baseline, but uh, in response to acetylcholine shows quite marked vasoconstriction. And uh, there's a little bit of constriction adjacent to that, but um, primarily there's a fairly focal area of endothelial dysfunction. Whereas in response to nitroglycerin, you get fairly uniform dilatation. But actually, if you look at the, uh, the follow-up angiogram performed just over three and a half years later, we can see that this is without uh, exposing the blood vessel to acetylcholine, that that area of endothelial dysfunction that was brought out on uh, the endothelial function testing with acetylcholine now shows evidence of a fixed atherosclerotic lesion, which is potentially causing ischemia downstream in that left anterior descending territory. And going back to my earlier talk where we're looking at the impact of, of shear stresses and mechanical stresses and the, the more piecemeal influence of these flow stresses on, uh, on the endothelial activation and promotion of atherosclerosis, you can see that there's different, the differential areas of, of endothelial dysfunction are actually underpinning areas which are more susceptible to go on to develop more important structural lesions in, uh, in later life. So if we uh, pull things together, clearly the coronary circulation is where all the action is clinically. Now there are a number of advantages of, uh, of assessing coronary vascular function in vivo. The methodology is really well validated and providing you allow enough time for the patient to settle having done the angiogram and knowing what you're dealing with. The data are extremely detailed and, uh, and surprisingly uh, highly reproducible. Also accessing the coronary circulation, you can look at transcoronary uh, blood sampling to see if there is AV gradients in, for example, neutrophil activation, platelet activation, various uh, substances that you're interested to see, uh, whether they're changing across the circulation, so nit nitrogen oxides, endothelin, etc. Now, of course, because it's uh, the area that really truly does develop clinical disease, it's not an experimental model. I mean, we, we use the forearm circulation quite a lot. It's, a, it's an easily accessible circulation for both invasive and non-invasive testing, but it's not a, the forearm isn't a, a circulation which typically develops atherosclerotic disease, so that can only tell you part of what's going on, whereas investigating the coronary circulation ex itself tells us about what's happening in the... Uh, in the vascular structures which really uh, develop important uh, degrees of atherosclerosis at a population level and of course it's what we deal with as cardiologists and physicians and knowing what's happening in the coronary circulation in vivo really tells us more of what we need to know about the impact of uh, risk factors or interventions and so forth on the coronary vascular physiology and pathophysiology and of course potentially coronary vascular risk and outcomes. However there are a number of limitations of uh, in vivo coronary vascular function testing. Of course, it's invasive. It's a highly complex, time-consuming um, uh, process. You really can't recruit a truly healthy control group because it's not ethical to um, conduct coronary uh, 
at angiography and invasive physiology in people who are truly healthy. So the patients that we have studied with normal coronary arteries are individuals with uh, atypical chest pain syndromes, for example, who can't really be considered as truly normal, even if their coronary arteries appear healthy. So uh, on the other hand, uh, if, if, at the other extreme of disease, if you've got patients with really unsta unstable coronary disease or widespread severe obstructive disease, of course, it is risky to, to study these individuals. And, and of course, it would be difficult to interpret the results if we're dealing with multiple uh, obstructed vessels. So in view of the potential risk and ability to interpret the results, you can't study people with severe disease. So therefore, it's um, really relatively restricted in, the, ty in the, the type and the number of patients that we can study. So we can't do the large epidemiological vascular studies that are possible with um, uh, other non-invasive uh, technology. And of course, because it's somewhat uh, uh, unethical, in, depending on the circumstances, but to, to perform routine invasive follow-up, uh, of course, that has been done in a, in a small number of cases, but only where the scientific um, validation is really quite, uh, quite substantial, that uh, it is very difficult to perform prospective longitudinal studies uh, on the coronary circulation. So uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Goodbye.